So, so this paper, um, I hate it when people issue lots of caveats, but it is work in progress. It's based on a project that I've been developing, working with Professor Helen Johnston from Hull University and Professor Barry Goldson, who's a criminolo uh, sociologist over at Liverpool University. And the idea of the research, the theme of the research, is to really take the history of Borstal uh, from its establishment in the early 20th century through to its abolition in 1982. And at the moment, we're still waiting to hear whether we've got the large amount of money that we need to, to do the project, which takes quite a long time to, wait for, to hear about these things. So what I want to do today is really trace the contours of that project and to give a clearer sense, I guess, of the functions and the form of the Borstal system. And I also want to explore some of the sort of key research areas that we're going to be looking at. So those of us here, some of, some of us hopefully, who were born, uh, sorry, were brought up in the, in the UK in the 1970s and 1980s will perhaps <coughs> think of the 1979 film Scum, uh, when Borstal is referred to. That's the sort of image we have of Borstal. And it's understandable why, why this would be the case. So this was originally written as a play for today on the BBC, but it was immediately banned, so it was never shown um, at the time. And then it was released a couple of years later as a film release. It was sort of refilmed and released for a cinema release. Um, and it very much contributed to the increasingly vocal debate about the abuses of the system that had been developing in that period. But if we look back at the much earlier concepts of Borstal, what's called the Borstal experiment, from the early 20th century, and particularly the interwar period, it describes an institution which really bears little similarity to what, would become, what, what the institution would become in the final decades of its existence. And a key question, I think, underpinning this research is, is really about how did an institution that saw its major development in a period of where the penal system was really characterised by a sort of liberal paternalism, how did it shift from this institution to what we might call, well, what I call anyway, the scum era of the post-war period? So why was there such a change and why was it a failing institution by the early 1980s? Now, I'm not going to be able to actually answer that question today because I haven't been able to do all the research yet. But what I will do is explore the changing character of the system and start to think about some of these questions and some of the broader context for the changes that we see. So before I go on to do that, I want to outline the project and say a little bit more about the research approach and methodologies. And then I'll talk a bit about the early development of Borstal from the pre-war to the interwar period and also say something very briefly about the pre-First World War Borstal records. Finally, I'm going to, in the sort of last part of the paper, I want to return to SCUM, and more broadly I want to talk about the cultural representations of Borstal in the post-war period, some of which will be familiar to you, and consider the extent to which the changing forms of these representations reflect the changing character of the Borstal system. So, I've got a gadget. Did you, yeah? Does it work? Oh, wow. it works. Okay, so some basic sort of facts about Borstal. Um, these were institutions designed for youths aged 17 to 21. There was a period in the 30s when they do extend the range, age range up to 23, but that doesn't work, so they go back down to 21. There's a, obviously an overlap with the institutions for juvenile offenders that go up to 16, and there's a very blurred boundary between sort of 15, 16, 17 in terms of what sort of institution you go to. So some 16-year-olds, for example, who would normally be sent to a reformatory school or an approved school after 1933, if they are considered hardened in crime enough, may actually be sent straight to Borstal. Um, it's interesting, fairly recently I looked at some of the records for A3 <coughs> Girls Borstal, the, the one Girls Borstal in the early period, and I saw that a significant number of the girls there were aged 16 going on 17, and what had happened there is they'd gone to a crew school around 15, 16, they'd tried to abscond from a crew school, and then they'd been sent straight to Borstal. A fascinating thing about many of these girls is that they'd gone to a crew school in the first place because of pregnancy 
and obviously being made to give their babies up. So they're, they're morally delinquent in, according to the sort of language of the time. So types of different Borstal institutions. There's actually, Borstal is a very broad term in terms of what it encompasses. So there's the individual institutions, which often were repurposed prisons. Um, so for example, the original Borstal uh, in Borstal Village, Kent, Rochester, near Rochester, gave the system its name. So it was Borstal Prison, then it becomes Borstal, uh, Borstal, Borstal. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it becomes Borstal, Borstal. It becomes HMP Borstal and becomes obviously synonymous with uh, young, young, young adult offenders. Similarly, um, Aylesbury Borstal was specifically repurposed as a girls' Borstal in, nine, in um, the 1930s. So you've got these specific, uh, specific individual borstals, then you've also got borstal wards within adult prisons, and these are sometimes referred to as the modified borstal system. Uh, so this would be maybe a ring or a couple of rings devoted to, uh, to borstal training, as it was referred. So again, Aylesbury Prison, which had been a women's prison, then gets a borstal ring, and then it becomes a completely a full, a full borstal for girls. You've also got open borstals, and these start opening in the 1930s, so in the interwar period, and the most well-known ones are Loudoun Grange in Nottinghamshire and North Sea Camp, which is on the Lincolnshire, camp, the Lincolnshire coast, which both open in the 30s, and I'll come back to those institutions. And then finally, you've also got borstal allocation rings. So these are sort of rings where you go and rate to then be sent to another borstal. So any of you who have read um, Borstal Boy by Brendan Beer will know that he was I think, sent to Falcon, which was sometimes used for, for that sort of allocation, and then you would go to another borstal and he went to Policy Bay. So there's a, a sort of a different system and different elements that come, up, come into it and that develop in the sort of broader period of development. So here, just to sort of these pictures that we've got here. This chap here, this is uh, around 1909, 1910, and he is at um, looking very miserable with Hanford Peaks at Rochester Borstal. And so, obviously, they're sort of privileging that idea of sort of rural training and fresh air, farm training and labouring being one way to sort of instill uh, good citizenship and reform onto these lads. Uh, this is, um, again, Rochester Borstal, the opening, obviously, is a modern picture. That's uh, Loudon Grange, sort of work room there in the 1940s. Uh, this is a 1919 image from the uh, Aylesbury Methods, and this chap here is a pre-First World War Borstal boy. So we've got various sort of sources from that earlier period. So why do the project now? So I want to just say something about what I call a sort of historiography gap in terms of the writing about Borstal. There isn't a full history of Borstal, this is the main thing. The, the first history was written by Lionel Fox and it was published in the 1950s and it looked back on the development of the early system. And as well as Fox, there's various other texts by penologists and criminologists and lawyers. Um, for example, Robert Roger Hood's uh, Borstal Reassessed is one of the really well-known ones that came out in 1965. Now, the problem is with this is they're often written by penal insiders and they're written by the at the time that the system is still in operation. So, for example, Lionel Fox was actually the prison commissioner. So it's a very you know, so it's not a very subjective history of the system. Obviously, um, we do have some more academic histories. The most well known is the excellent book by uh, Victor Bailey, but that is a book more generally on young offenders, so it's not just about young adult offenders, and it only goes up to 1948 when the Criminal Justice Act is passed, so it doesn't go past the Second World War, or just the, you know, just only just past the Second World War. And we do have a more recent history, which is also very good, called Ireland's Moral Hospital, which is about the one borstal in the Republic of Ireland, which is called St. Patrick's in Clonmel, and that closed in the 1950s. So there's this sort of gap. There's no history of the borstal system that focuses on the experience of inmates 
And so the aim, part, one of the aims of this project is to really give some sort of insight into the first generations of Broadstall youths and those who were employed to work in the system, both as masters and as teachers and later on as social workers. And in fact, a key undertaking of the proposed research project, the one we just put the, money, the, the bid in for, is to collect oral testimony with former inmates and those who worked in the Borstals from the 1950s through to the 1980s. And I think we think this is really important, you know, and that we're getting to the optimal time really to collect these histories because the earliest of those generations are obviously reaching the end of their lives. So, moving on what I call Borstal, The Early Years, which sounds like a really interesting book. Um, so I don't know how well you can see that table, probably not that well. Um, so Borstal was intrinsically linked to the juvenile penal estate, um, which in the later 19th century was composed of the reformatory school system, the semi-penal industrial schools, and also some juvenile wards in mainstream adult prisons. So the, what was seen as the, the real success of the reformatory school was key in the debates about young adult prisoners at the 1895 Prison Committee, and this was the committee more popularly known as the Gladstone Committee. And at this committee, the, the, what they see as the sort of issue or the problem of young adult prisoners, those aged between 16 and 21, was very much emphasised. So it's a bit like, well, we've solved the juvenile crime problem, sort of, you know, the reformatory and industrial schools are doing well, so let's see what we can do with this age group now, because they're on this sort of cusp, this recognition that they're much more on this cusp between, uh, I guess, adolescence and adulthood. So we've got these statistics here, these are judicial statistics from 1893, and the pie charts made up from them there. And what we can see is that young adult prisoners um, account for a significant proportion of the penal population. So the young adult prisoners have a grey slice, then the yellow slice is 21 to 30 year olds, and the orange is uh, juveniles. So essentially, you know, that, that huge area accounts for all of those prisoners under 21, uh, about 21 and under. And the committee were very focused on the problem of short sentences for this class of offender. Uh, so they worried that, you know, they'd, carry, they'd really build up these short sentences and all that would do was encourage re-offending. So they're much keener on giving them longer sentences, which they're presenting less in a punitive way and much more as a means of being able to enable reform. So we need to take them out of the system and we need to work with them to reform them to make them better citizens. It's this sort of language that you're seeing in, at the committee. And they also um, recommend that the age for entry to reformatories be extended from the, the, the highest age, 16 to 21. So they're initially thinking, should we do it with the reformatory system, just extend it up to 21. So Sir Evelyn Ruggles Rice, who was the prison commission, prison commission at the time, was the principal architect of Borstal. And at the 1895 committee, he states that the proposal is to deal systematically with the young ruffian, the hooligan of the London streets, the callous and precocious young criminal on whom the present system of treatment in prison makes no impression and who graduates through a succession of short local sentences into a fixed career. Of habitual crime. So this is what they're trying to sort of challenge. <coughs> so at this stage there wasn't a clear commitment to build a separate estate rather than just extending the reformatory school system. But it's so it's, it is suggested that they can keep certain reformatories specifically for lads and girls according to their age and to their character. And so Ruggles Bryce from the quote here believed that the, an institution should be established that was a halfway house between the prison and reformatory, situated in the country with ample space for agricultural and land reclamation work. It would have penal and coercive sites, but it would be amply provided with a staff capable of giving sound education, training the inmates in various kinds of industrial work, and qualified generally to exercise the best and healthiest kind of moral influence. Now, they, they do establish um, 
a dorsal experiment quite early on. So there's one in Bedford Prison in, at 1900 um, and Rochester Convict Prison, obviously in Borstal Village in 1902, so, as, as I said, which gives the system its name. The Borstal sentence itself was enacted in 1908 with the Prevention of Crime Act and it was aimed squarely at youths aged 16 to 21 with previous convictions and or who had been identified as having what they called criminal habits or tendencies. Now, this early system comes under crit uh, uh, quite a lot of criticism fairly early on, and basically what the critics are saying is, you know, the system that you're developing is actually no different from the adult prison, and they're, they're becoming just as ex uh, corrupted by the experience. But at the same time, there is some recognition of the merits, and this is from the Graphic um, pre uh, magazine, and it's an article, I just thought it was rather wonderful, the images, it's called The Loafer's Progress from 1908, and it remarks in relation to Borstal, the puny race product begins to assume a new value, the street corner degenerate to fill out and hold up his head. Physical efficiency brings moral tone and the youth gains in alertness and respect. So it's all those sort of fears from this period, fears of degeneration, fears of national decline, of physical inefficiency that are sort of coming through here. And we have this wonderful um, thing here, the typical lad headed for Borstal, and this is very much aimed at fears about street gambling. And the, the, you won't be able to see the captions, but they actually read, the first one is a, a hopeless trade, and then this chap, licensed by his country to go to ruin, and then this says, little parasites betting mania. So um, great focus there, I think, on street life and street disorder. So moving to the interwar period, um, the critics will be appeased in this period. Um, there's many changes which are instituted under the influence of a new prison commissioner. And this was the iconic penologist, reformer, and youth worker Alexander Patterson, this chap here. So Patter Patterson's modifications to Borsal referred to the adoption of what he called a moral system, and it included physical training, extended education, sports, and the in introduction of the house system. And it was based on the belief that youths could have an allegiance and identity shaped by their house and loyalty to their house master, and it's very roughly based on a sort of public school model. Now, during Patterson's tenure, the estate expands. Uh, the pre-war Borstal, so Rochester, Feltham, and um, in Middlesex and Aylesbury that I've already mentioned, uh, were joined by Portland in Dorset, Campbell on the Isle of Wight, Sherwood in Nottingham, and then the three open Borstals, so Loudon Grange, North Sea Camp, and then Hollisley Bay as well in 1938. So the relationship between the staff and the inmates in the interwar Borstal was very much idealised. Uh, rather than referring to inmates and screws, if we think of the sort of um, you know, the popular language to describe those relationships, Borstal privileged the relationship between masters and lads. And this different sort of connection was reflected by the civilian aspect of the staff, who didn't wear uniforms and were encouraged to develop very personal relationship with the boys in their houses. So they used the house system again, like the public school model. And we can see this particularly reflected in the work, um, the writing of the first governor of Loudoun, Jane, uh, Loudoun Grange, W. W. Llewellyn. And in um, 1930, Llewellyn had actually led boys and staff on a march from Feltham <coughs> uh, Borstal, where he had been the uh, governor, um, up to uh, Loudoun Grange in Nottingham, where they actually went and constructed the first open Borstal, so it's this very famous march that uh, I've got some images of which I'll show you in a moment. And in an article that he published about the founding, founding of the Borstal, the realm described how the youths were selected. So he sort of says, when the lads are picked at the collecting centre, they are told that they will create not only a new Borstal building, but a new spirit and traditions which will live after them. They have a choice. If they choose to come to Loudon Grange, they know that they must make this promise because of the trust put in me, I promise on my honour to do my best to keep up the good name of Loudon Grange. And from the start, the aim is to build up the sense of honour and loyalty 
inherent in very British, in any in every British boy. Again, very relevant at the time, but also <coughs> the sort of scout movement, which obviously started around uh, the turn of the century. So some of this idealised relationship can be found um, between the men and the boys can be seen in photographs from a second march, which is the march that Llewellyn led from Stafford Prison over to North Sea Camp, again to construct the open bore store. Um, so these snapshots are from, from um, this the march, and I think they're quite interesting. So you, you've got these sort of, so here the boys are marching in formation. This is at the start of the march where they, you know, they could be public school boys. And then we've got these incredibly bucolic images, really, of the, I think he's got like a squirrel or some sort of cuddly rodent, if there's such a thing. <laughs> and uh, this one, I think, is amazing, where they're stepping over it. It's very sort of like, like I said, very sort of like rural sort of bucolic image. Um, so I think they're really interesting, and they obviously gloss over some potential problems in terms of that relationship between the boys and the man, men. And, you know, I, I'll come back to this very briefly, but I think, you know, the backdrop to this is the fact that we are now going through um, the sort of inquiries into uh, child sexual abuse in institutions. So it's, I think you have to keep this at the back of your mind when you think about the, relate, the development of these relationships. On the other hand, it's very interesting looking at these men who are the governors and the masters and their particular background. So they're very much shaped by the military context um, of the First World War. So both Patterson and Llewellyn, for example, had seen action in World War I and had served alongside young working class men, much the same age as the, uh, these early Borstal boys. And I think you know, the vision of the course that these men hoped to achieve may have been shaped by their experience of war. Patterson had been the founder of the Talbot House Movement, which is more popularly known as TOC H, um, one of the founders anyway, and during the war that provided rest and recreation for soldiers coming back from the front in Belgium. And actually TOC H also uh, provided the sort of food and accommodation on both of those marches that I've just described, so that relationship continues beyond the war. So there's this ideal, I think, with Patterson, men like Patterson and Llewellyn, of Christmas service, er, uh, Christmas service, it's Freudian, so Christian service, which sort of shapes this. I think also, oh, just very quickly, pictures, I'm showing you these. Sorry, these I think are from the earlier war. Um, early in March, so here's a group of sort of the lads together. I think this is Llewellyn, but I'm not entirely sure, obviously sort of larking a little bit of one of the lads. But again, I think we, you know, we have to be careful about how we think about and interpret these images. So the Great War also provides some important context for understanding the early development of Borstal, as we found in some early work on the first generation of Borstal boys who came through Rochester and Falcon. So the earliest Home Office case <coughs> models deal um, date from 1908, and they hold the records of I think it's between 90 and 100 uh, boys who entered Borstal in the years leading up to the First World War, following the policy of a sort of amnesty and releasing prisoners to go and serve uh, in the war. So most of these boys go to the front, and almost all uh, of the boys died at the front, or subsequently of injuries sustained in the conflict. So in his book, Boy, Boy Soldiers of the Great War, Richard Van Emden uh, noted that by March 1915, some 600 Borstal boys were known to be uh, amongst those who were serving. Um, just an example of one of those boys, sorry about the quality of the picture, this was Richard Wilde, who was convicted at the Essex Quarter Sessions in July 1912, at the age of 17, he'd stolen a bicycle. And for that, he received a three-year sentence in Borstal. So he does okay in Borstal, he knuckles down, but then he's discharged into the care of his father, who he had a rather fraught relationship with in early March 1915. And a week later, the Borstal agents at the sort of probation service known as Borstal Association, so the Borstal agent, Mr McKenna, received a letter from Richard, 
uh, stating that he had enlisted in the Essex Regiment, so he didn't want to stay at home, he enlisted, and there's a pressure to enlist anyway. And so the Brussels Association writes really and continuously for news following up, so in, in, in sort of spring and summer, so in May and July. And finally in August they get news from his parents that he'd been killed in action. And this is a news, this is stuff from it that was in his file, this is a newspaper cutting that was there, which tells us that he was um, killed at Gallipoli on the 5th of August 1915, age 20. Though much of what we know about the earlier incarnation of Gorstall ends in the 1940s with the Second World War and the retirement of Alexander Patterson in 1945 and his death the following year. So whilst historians can access the earliest Borstal inmate records and have some limited access to the material that survives from the interwar period, the last three decades of Borstal are much less accessible. However, it seems to me that some of the most important questions to be asked about the evolution of the Borstal system concern that last three decades or so between around 1945 and 1982. How am I so whilst the records of administration and government bureaucracy can furnish us with information about the outlines of the service and the running of the establishments, and prison commission reports can tell us about diet, uh, health, education, and the work that you use the license to do, this only provides us with very limited insights into the lived experience of Borstal inmates. So for this, of course, we'll need to turn to oral testimony that I've already briefly mentioned. So from those who went through the service as inmates or as staff from the post-war through to the 80s. But one of the ways we can also better understand these changes is by looking at how Borstal and its inmates were represented in contemporary popular culture. So, Borstal in popular culture. So the Borstal genre, if it's fair to call it that, possibly not, um, really consists of one, so one short story one autobiography and four plays or screen plays. Uh, both the autobiography and short story were written in the 1950s, late 1950s, and this is a period in which the Patterson model uh, was really coming to an end. The Irish playwright Brendan Behan, obviously some of you may know this, uh, bought his, his book Borstal Boy, published in 1958, and this really stands up as the most significant account, personal account of the Borstal experience in 20th century Britain. Um, obviously, pictured here, uh, Alan Silito's The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner was published in 1959, and this was a, the title story from a short story collection, and it would later be ad adapted into one of the period's most iconic films. Now, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, the film, wasn't the first to actually depict the Borstal experience. So in 1949, end of the war, I mean, after, just after the war, Gainsborough Pictures released the prison drama Boys in Brown, and it stars a very young Dickie Abendroer um, and Dirk Bogart, and uh, a vuncular Jack Warner playing the prison governor. Um, the film's depiction of Borstal uh, youths contained little critique of the system and in contrast conveyed the message that only by knuckling down and playing the game, to borrow a public school phrase, would their lives improve. So it was a largely positive image of the system. But yet this is being shown in a period where the system was increasingly under strain and more use were being filtered in a much, into a much less selective system. So, from the late 1950s, there were growing concerns about juvenile delinquency. House war panics about youth crime emerged in Britain in the late 40s and the 50s. And these anxieties about crime were fuelled by the growth of new markets for teenagers and growing some consumption by young people. So in Britain, teenagers who had never had it so good spent their money on records, on cinema and clothes, and various of a what seems to us now is harmless teenage paraphernalia. Um, and this was very much the distrust of their elders who believed that it had contributed to an increase in youth delinquency. So obviously we've got sort of teddy boys here, teddy boys there, teddy, teddy girls, these wonderful 
pictures taken by the uh, director, Ken Russell, um, late on in the 60s, the Martin Roberts disturbance, and um, this picture here, which I'm going to talk about, which isn't a very good picture, I'm afraid it's a still from a film. I did have some wonderful YouTube clips, but I'm afraid they don't work very well in these rooms, so I couldn't actually show them, so I'm going to have to talk you through them instead. So new ball stores in this period start to open, including, as you can see here, Everfall in the East Riding, so in East Yorkshire, which opens in a as, as a response to the expanding number of inmates. And the contemporary cafe footage, which can be found on YouTube, describes the new Borstal in really jaunty towns. Um, it's essentially optimistic, yet within a few years of this, Borstal would be seen as a failing institution. So in fact, from 10 minutes, yeah. So in fact, from the 1940s, accounts of violent disorder in Borstal had increased. So in 1945, there's disturbances at Aylesbury Girls. A hose was, fire hose was used to control what was called a display of indiscipline. In November 48, a Sherwood inmate had murdered the matron, 46-year-old Irene Phillips, and 21-year-old Head of Strixon was later found guilty and executed at Lincoln Prison. In 1949, again at Sherwood, another riot, a riot involving 200 boys, resulted in the stabbing of a warder. In 1951, there was a widely reported inquiry into the rioting at Portland Borstal, and then there were further disturbances at Hall Borstal in 53 and 57, Dumfries in 63, and Reading Borstal in 67. And in many of these disturbances, the alleged mistreatment of inmates by officers <coughs> was cited. So by the 1960s, the increasing pressures on the system would start to be reflected in more critical cultural representations. <coughs> So Silito's uh, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, published, uh, as something I've already mentioned, which is narrated by Colin Smith, um, a young working class man from Nottingham who's been committed to a ball store called Ruxton Towers for breaking and entering a bakery. And Smith's skills as a runner are quickly noticed by the governor, who's keen for the ball store to win a cross-country competition. Um, in a sort of intervarsity competition with a local private store. And we've got a wonderful phrase, which is possibly a slightly offensive, so apologies for that. So it's seething with antagonism. This is Smith, uh, this is the character played by Tom Courtney. They're training up fine for the big sports day when all the pig nosed, pig faced, snotty nosed dudes and ladies who can't have two or two together and will mess themselves like loonies if they didn't have slogans to back and forth. Come and make speeches to us about sports being just a thing to get us leaving an honest life and keep our itching fingernails off their shop locks at safe angles and hair grips to open gas meters. So you really see you know, this sort of, he's, he, he refers to the governor's, you know, lily white, worthless hands. Um, so it, it does provide a, this story does provide a harsher representation of the Boston environment. Um, but even so, even though you have this sort of Colin Smith's antagonism, the warders are largely presented as being, um, I guess, distant but well-meaning and a little bit out of touch. Now, some of the um, increasing tension in the actual Borstal estate is, um, going forward too much, is reflected in the film version of The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, which is directed by Tony Richardson and released in 1962. And in this version, Smith's given a protagonist, Stacey, and um, the success of Smith on the running field basically challenges uh, Stacey's position as the daddy of the ward. And so you have these scenes when uh, Stacey tries to run away from Ruxton House and he's recaptured by the masters and brought back to the board store. And what Richardson does in the direction, he uses the Jerusalem hymn throughout the, sort of the, the film, and he uses it particularly effectively by, he films the boys singing Jerusalem, and he uses um, board store boys as extras, and he intersperses it with clips of Stacy being brought back, and then the sort of, he, he shows one of the masters with a, a belt who's obviously going to beat him but he stopped short of the beating. And in actual fact, in the original version of the film, they had included the beating, but then the British Board of Film Censors made them cut it out, and many more of the sort of more, um, I guess, sort of more critical elements of the film. So 
whilst the film version of Loneliness intimated some of the problems that the, sea, that the system was experiencing, it would take another 15 years for the most revelatory, revelatory rather, portrayal of Borstal to appear. So Roy Minton and Alan Clark's Scum was originally conceptualised and filmed as a play for the BBC, but banned through the vigorous interventions of the public decency campaign and Mary Whitehouse. Now, two years later, Minton and Clark remade it as a film, as it said, and despite being toned down from the original version, it remained highly controversial in its depiction of violence and bullying, not only amongst the inmates, but also by the prison warders. And some of the most brutal scenes concerned the fight for dominance of um, Avery between Carlin, who was played by a young Ray Winston, and another inmate called Banks. Um, and in a famous scene that I'm not going to be able to show you, um, Carlin violently asserts dominance over Banks with the memorable book quote, I'm the daddy, and the next time I will dot, 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 ing, kill ya. So, um, is that the best way to say it? <laughs> Effing kill ya. <laughs> so, Scum is a much more realistic portrayal of the institution than its predecessors. Whilst this was largely a closed world to investigators, the evidence of violence that was occurring in the system is an apparent in the press throughout the post-war period. Moreover, the film shows other elements of the Borsal experience which have been lacking from earlier depictions, and not least of these was the large number of black inmates who were subject, not surprisingly, to racism both from other inmates and from staff. And this version of Borstal is essentially a prison. The staff who run the institution are portrayed as incompetent, uncaring and unimaginative. And the most controversial scene shows prison officers turning a blind eye to the rape by another inmate of a boy who would later commit suicide. Now there's little doubt that Scum, that the purpose of Scum was to directly critique the system. Minton had undertaken considerable research in his writing of Scum and he'd, he'd interviewed around a former, uh, hundred former Borstal boys. After the BBC ban, Clark and Minton went to a great deal of effort to actually get the, the film produced and out into the cinemas um, even though it was watered down from the original television version. And within two years of the cinema release of Scum, um, Borstal would be abolished by the Criminal Justice Act of 1982 and replaced with youth custody centres. And I've got about two minutes to just conclude. So by way of conclusion, I'd like to speak briefly about some of the questions raised by the research so far. And I think the central, for me, at the moment, the central underpinning question relates to this nature of the shift from the pre-war to the post-war Borstal. Um, just to contextualise this a little bit further, in the 1930s there's this off-quoted statistic that 70% of Borstal leavers desist from crime. By the late 60s, this statistic, this statistic had apparently reversed. And one explanation for this was that it was down to what they called the declining quality of Borstals, but also a deterioration in the quality of the boys, and this is their words. Um, I think the thing is that we have found is that in the pre-war period, less youths were actually committed to Borstal. So in the late 20s and 30s, around two-thirds of males aged 16 to 21 were committed to Borstal's the rest went to prison. By the late 40s, around 95% of that age group go straight to Borstal. So in the early years, Borstal was much more selective and they tended to select, to select boys who they, and girls who they thought were likely to respond to Borstal training. It's also complicated by the fact that the statistics they're talking about, uh, that 70% is based on indictable crimes, and that's based on much more serious crimes and relatively serious offences like theft, burglary and petty assault. Whereas what we've also found is that youths were sent to Borstal for much lesser offences. And so there's a chap I've already talked to who was sent to Loudon Grange in the 50s, I think, for breach of contract to marry. He promised to marry the girl next door and then did a runner and they brought him back and he did a runner again. And so then he was sent to Borstal for breach of contract. And that actually was still a thing, still on the statute book until 1970. So we do need to problematise the interwar Borstal. Patterson casts a long shadow and his reputation is rarely critically assessed. In a climate now that's stripping away the veneer of many of the institutions that have been that have historically cared for offending and for children and for vulnerable young people, um, the assumptions underlying underlying the Patterson era of the interwar, I think, need to be dismantled. 
Um, and it's a, it's a view that holds significant power, as was reflected in a relatively recent attempt to bring back Borstal um, that was shown on television in ITV in 2015. Uh, the Telegraph at the time described it as uh, showing the virtues of hard graft, discipline and a second chance. So I think we need to much more critically go back and under, under, uh, try to unpack this assumption um, that the interwar system worked in a more positive way. So I'm going to leave it there because otherwise I'll never finish. So, Michelle, thank you. Very much. to be honest, but then I got the company to send it me. Um, I got about two episodes in and then I just had to give up because it was so dreadful. Um, the guy, I, I hope this isn't a controversial thing to say, the guy who was the, and I can't remember his name now, the guy who they put as governor is a, is a sort of celebrity criminologist, David, you know what I mean then? Wilson. Wilson. Um, and if you talk to any criminologist, for example, Barry Goldson, who's a sociologist, a very well known sociologist in the field of youth justice, if I say David Wilson to him, he literally sees. Um, <laughs> so um, basically, Wilson casts himself as Patterson. You know. um, I mean, I hate, I mean, I have to say, I really struggle with, with those sort of reality TV kind of things, but um, you know, the sort of like when they put the boys set the boys to the front and all that sort of thing, I find them quite offensive in some ways. So it was interesting, what was interesting I think to me, we were watching it, um, was just how wholeheartedly they'd taken on the sort of public school view of um, Patterson and um, the, you know, that era. It's re and it's really hard because the sort of, the, the extent to which we can really get into that stuff, you know, we can get into the records, there is access to those records, but obviously, you know, things around abuse, for example, are just not sort of, You'll find physical abuse, violent abuse, but nobody's going to say anything about sexual abuse. And part of me almost thinks I don't want to go there because it's so controversial. So, but it's interesting because I think that series did have a very, well, was quite influential with lots of sort of comments in the sun and papers like that about like, this is what we should do, you know, to sort of bring back national service, bring back Dorsal. And <coughs> well, what I would say is, you know, I, I'm real, I really think that people can have a really bad time in an institution and other people being there at the same time and actually have a very different perspective. Um, I think that there, I'm almost certain that there were problems in the course of the Tennessee, but, but then I've also, you know, in that early period, I've talked to the daughter of um, Hope, who was um, mentored by Llewellyn and who was the governor of uh, Horsley Bay in the 40s, and I think he overlapped very briefly with Brendan Deer. And she's a lady in her 80s now, and obviously she's going to tell me this way, but you know, she sort of very much sort of, if anyone's read Bit at B, and they'll know that he, paint, he painted almost a dimmick sort of picture of Hollisley Bay and being by the sea, and that's really, she pretty much confirmed that, you know, playing croquet, for God's sake, with the ball store boys and sort of thing. But, you know, so it's difficult unpacking some of that, you know, and some, some people, some of the people who worked in the system were very well meaning, but it doesn't mean that there weren't abuses of that system. So I've walked straight away from the original question. So how much did, how much did um, scum influence some of the public discussion in the early 80s? I think it did, but that's something, what I'd like to find out is how much you know that there's actually, um, it, it fed into the political sort of mm -hmm. discussions. I mean, I did go to look at the um, archives in the BBC, written archive down in Reading, and it's sort of fascinating. Um, the BBC are very sensitive at that time. They had quite a lot of complaints about violent depictions, and not just to do with, um, you know, these sort of in prisons with injustice. Some of Dennis Potters were, for example, 
know, so they have quite a lot of banning. And so they do seem to be absolutely, you know, ultra sensitive to this stuff. So the poor old school doesn't even get out the gates. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're absolutely furious, you know, the, I can't remember the name of the female producer who was going on now at the time. Um, but she was furious because of the amount of money they had spent on it and so on. Um, but yeah, I, I do get the sense. I think not only does it feed into the debates, I also think it is a response to, to debates. So it doesn't, they don't come out of nowhere. There's a lot of this, you know, talk of changing the system has been going on for quite a long time. And I think the, the, the you know, scum obviously sort of adds to that. What I should also say is that just because the Borstals closed in 1982, although some have gone a little bit, doesn't mean the system suddenly becomes better, you know. So what replaces it is, is in many ways as problematic, mm -hmm. but just in different ways. Question from Rachel. Uh, that's a question about the photographs of yeah. the kids, and it's in relation to your talk you and I got attended last week, where the criminologist talked about her ethical dilemmas about huh. showing images of people who've been characterized as criminals and that. But at the same time, for me, when I see you talking about this and showing those pictures, that's where sort of my emotions get engaged. And so I wonder if like, you thought about either the ethics or the kind of emotional content of the pictures, what it means to you to show them. Yeah, I have, endlessly. And the, 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 the stuff that's the 30s, I'm, I'm less worried about it in a sense, because they are, you know, if you follow the rules, they're adults, you know, 70 years, and um, they're not going to go away, although some of their descendants might be, you know, I appreciate that. I was, I really ran into this actually with some pictures from the 1940s. I won't say where, but I was allowed access to an album that I actually shouldn't have been allowed to have access. But, you know, I'm a historian, so I'm not going to say no when they put it in front of me, you know. And that was a girls, it was a medical album of girls in um, Aylesbury. And um, I have to say, it was a I saw the green view, you know, it makes me, I have trouble about using them, but in a sense, I'd always be much more interested in the boys, you know, art and cultures and that, so, but it really shifted my opinion, because, I mean, that's where I found out that thing about how many of the girls have been pregnant and gone into approved schools and then absconded, but the pictures are heartbreaking, they look like they're in a field lab or something, they, their hair is often shaved because they've got knits or whatever, the, the doctor, one assumes it's a doctor, you know, um, the, the trained doctor who's actually doing, uh, taking the records, but he, he talks about them as though they're inhuman, morally dirty. I've never seen anything like it, you know, and so some of these girls actually go from, they get pregnant to maybe at 14, they go to an approved school, they go to board school, some of them then go out to institutes for the feeble minded, and um, I actually, you know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say I did actually feel quite weepy while I was looking at them because they were sort of so moving. Um, you just can't believe how it, 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 it looked. Obviously, with this man, this doctor, they were less than human the way he talked about them. And this is the 1940s that these images were taken in. These women may still just about, I guess, be alive. You know, could be. And I was really shocked at that. I mean, maybe that was my naivety. I don't know, but it was, you know, so it puts you in a pretty difficult position about whether you use them or, yes, the other, you know, it does, it does serve a function. I, and also the thing is when I started this project, <coughs> I spoke to a couple of chaps who were former Boston boys who contacted me because of some publicity that Becky had put out. And actually from both of them, they said, we're so pleased that you go with this because we feel that our story is really being glossed over. Nobody talks about, you know, hardly anyone talks about what happened with Boston and the sort of things. These obviously, this is a post war system. So it is a difficult one, I think. You know, I've seen other issues you speak about in terms of genes abuse. Well, yeah, but the, that's obviously that goes to a massive sort of ethics compliance thing. And I, I mean, we're, we're <coughs> getting money, we'll appoint somebody to specifically do that and we've got that experience. As much as I would love to 
And told the story, she said, an audience that the Glasgow Committee itself has a lot of problems with violence, with outstanding uh, with mutinies and so on. So I think it is as this sort of like I think there's this spirit of idealism that sets up these things and it just gets worn away. In the reality it's uh, probably around finance, the usual stuff that impacts on the institutions that still do today. Um, and sometimes, you know, we can move on and you might have the, you might have somebody like Patterson and I don't think, you know, I think Patterson, I'm sure he wasn't quite as heroic as he portrayed. But somebody like Patterson was very involved early on and then sort of moves on and so personnel change as well. I think the interesting thing is as well that um, at the start of the reformatory and industrial school movement, there was always a tension between two things, which is how punitive we should be and how reformative we should be. So they were always divided about when we punish them and when we reform them. And of course that behavior constantly goes on today. And you know, the prison system in the state as a whole is you know, it's constantly caught in this cycle, isn't it, of repetition and we're about to come out with secure schools again. Well that's it, I was about to, I was gonna I, I, I ran out of time, but obviously I was gonna say something about Feltham and all the reports in the last few years of the, the violence in Feltham, keeping boys in twenty four hours solitary confinement, etc. etc. You know, history sort of repeating itself again. Yeah. And also not all of that is true having worked at Feltham for the last eight years. All oh, right. <laughs> joint event with the um, lead city councils um, out in the past, their um, LGBTQ History Month conference that's going to be following up the day after on the Thursday. Yes, so keep, keep an eye out for that. But um, <coughs> thank you very much to Heather for a really, really rich